We've been talking about the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms, if we go back to the very beginning and start going over the basics again, we know it was divided into, you know, do you know how many uh, divisions there are? What's that? Five. Very good. There are five divisions. And they all line up with the first five books of the Bible. The Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We are at a junction where we are actually looking at what is a trilogy in the book of Psalms. We looked at Psalm 22, which portrayed Jesus Christ and his office as prophet. We looked at Psalm 23, which looked at Jesus Christ in his role as priest. And then we looked at, we're going to look today at Psalm 24 and Jesus Christ in his office as king. Those three go hand in hand. Jesus Christ, when he was in the office of prophet, was referring to his earthly ministry. Jesus Christ in his office as priest is where he is right now. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And as we look at Psalm 24, we will see that it shows us him in his kingly rule when he comes back and takes the throne of his father, David, in Jerusalem. The literal reign of Christ on the earth. If we turn to Psalm 24, that's where we're going to be looking at today. Psalm chapter 24. And if we go ahead, I'll go ahead and read it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, he that has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. See love. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, lift up, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. And even let them up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. So we're looking at Psalm chapter 24 today. Psalm 24. And we're getting ready to go over our typical, what do you think is the key verse, key phrase, key words in this passage. So we'll start with the little broad one, key words. As we've looked at Psalm 24, what might be some key words? When we talk about key words, key phrases, key verses, these are all things that might help sum up this passage in a nutshell. So what are some of the key words in Psalm chapter 24? This will be it. Well, that's more of a phrase, brother. That's still more of a phrase, but what about a key word? How about one word, brother? How about we limit it to one word? So we could see it summed up in the word king, because when we go throughout this passage, it's talking about praise to the king, who is the king of glory. The earth, earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. What about some other words we might pull out? Lord How about one word? The Lord. So Lord. So Lord can summarize that up. Are there anything else in there? Righteousness. Righteousness. Because we're talking about who is righteous. Who can ascend into the hill of the Lord? When we talk about the Lord and the earth is his, we're talking about a righteous Lord. Not just any earthly Lord, but the Lord of hosts. He is righteous. And Jacob. 
Uh, I always say Jacob, brother, because it's not talking about Jacob. It mentions Jacob one time. But, but if you want to mark Jacob on your list, you can mark Jacob on your list because there is no right answer, there is no wrong answer with you. These are just to help us get a better understanding of this passage. I put down the earth because in verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. When we're talking about who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, we're still talking about people that are located on the earth. I also had world because it's kind of the same thing. We've all mentioned, already mentioned king, lord. Another one I would point out is, I think is in verse, well, we're talking about righteousness, but also talk about blessing in the same verse. So he who can ascend to the Lord is a blessed individual. And also I would throw in there generation, because we're talking about people. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? We have that question going on. Who is, are those people? So we're talking about a generation. And God of our salvation. Okay. If we're talking about key words, we're still talking about one word, brother. Single. God. God. So God would work too. But now we'll move into key phrases. Brother Eli's already said God of my salvation. Because the whole thing's talking about God for the most part. And it's talking about who is worthy to stand before God. Is there anything else we might be able to pe uh, pull out from there? A key phrase. Lift up your heads. Anything else? What was that one again, brother? Okay. He has scattered the floods. What are some key phrases that might summarize this entire passage in a nutshell? Like I said, there is no wrong answer. The whole purpose of a key word, key phrase, or a key verse is to try to describe this entire chapter through that one phrase, or that one word, or that one verse, or verses. Ascend into the hills of the Lord. Ascend into the hill of the Lord. How about the earth is the Lord's? Because when we're talking about this entire uh, chapter, we're talking about the earth, the Lord. It is God's world, but those generations that are seeking him are still contained within that world. So the earth is the Lord's. And how about generation that seek him? Because it's not just a matter of the earth being the Lord, but there at the end we have the question is, uh, who is worthy to stand on the holy hill of God? Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in this holy place? Does anybody else have anything else? The king of glory. So that summarizes the whole, uh, from I think 7 to verse 10, that is the answer. Let me just go back and when you start asking the questions, who is the king of glory? So we're talk, trying to figure out who he is. Does anybody have anything else when it comes to key phrases before we move on to key verses? Okay, so let's talk about key verses. What might be a verse or two or three verses, whatever you have to that would summarize this entire chapter in a nutshell? The reason we do one, I said out one, two, three verses are multiples is because when we go back to the time of the writing, to the time of Jesus Christ, and we want to say his Bible that he would have had in the synagogue, it did not look like this. Rather, it was, it was not broken down by chapter and it wasn't broken down by verse, but rather it was all laid out like a giant letter that somebody wrote to another individual. There were no divisions. But somebody's monk came along and he broke the Bible down into chapter and verses. And it makes this a whole lot easier for, to, for us to find things. Not that he did wrong. He did not add to the Word of God. But he made it a lot easier for us to locate things in the Word of God. So when it, comes, it seems like one chapter bleeds into another, maybe he didn't break it apart just right. But it's a whole lot easier trying to find something now than it was during the time of Christ. So one verse might also lead into another verse. So what are some key verses 
that can sum up Psalm chapter 24. Glory. Which verse is that, brother? Who is the King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Okay. Any other verses that we might say could sum up could summarize Psalm 24. Number five, you want to go ahead and read that one? He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord. And this is in, uh, in response to the question of who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place. Also, then we look down at um, the whole passage referring to God himself. It talks about righteousness from the God of his salvation. Is there anything else that we might use to summarize this in chapter in a nutshell? What other verses? Peter 3 verse, sums it up too. Yeah, he I, is the king of glory. Mm -hmm. Lord, Lord, he is the king of glory. Absolutely. Anybody else want to add anything before I throw my spin? I went with verse 1, which states, Who shall it of? Uh, the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Because when we look at this passage, we're talking about the earth, the world, and everybody within it. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And really, when we look at this verse, literal, this chapter literally, and realize instead, when we study out, it's actually talking about after the tribulation. And Christ comes back, sits his foot down on the Mount of Olives, and splits, and he actually takes the throne of David. So he's in the world at that point. We could also use verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Because we're trying to get, I do that because we're looking for the response of the generation that seek him. Verse 4. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not looked up his soul in a vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. So I've thrown three and four together because they do explain one another. And finally, I went with verse five, nine, where it says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift up, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in, referring to Jerusalem and the temple there. So those are the, some key words, key phrases, and key verses concerning this song. If we had to take a guess, who penned Psalm 24? David. David penned Psalm 24. And how do we know David penned Psalm 24? Because it says it's a psalm of David. It's very obvious. There's, we don't have to go back and say that so and Rabbi so and so documented that David wrote this psalm, but rather we have right there, it says a psalm of David. When we look at this Saul is not one of woe or despair. Sometimes when we look at the book of Saul, we look for it to be uplifting, and we might look for something that relates to our situation. And maybe a lot of times we'll go to Psalm 51, and I think it's verse 10, where David penned the words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit with me. Um, we talk about, we might go to where he might hide us under the shadow of the wings of the Almighty, and so forth and so forth. But when we look at this song, it's all about praise. There's nothing about woe. There's nothing that my enemies have come up against me like Psalm 22. They've come up to devour me. They are round about me. They pierce my saw eggs or my hands. We don't see anything like that. But in Psalm 24, it's all about praise. Praise to God. When we started off, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. They that dwell therein. And I'm going to get ahead of myself, so I'm going to stop right there. But in the meantime, if someone would please find first. Before I go any farther, though. So if someone wants to find 1 Corinthians 10 26, just hold that. 1 Corinthians 10 26. But when we look at this psalm itself, we could actually back up into the very last verse of Psalm 23 and see how this whole chapter is an add-on. Because 
Verse 6 of Psalm 23 states, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of, life, of my life. And then we have that last clause. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When we get into Psalm 24, it builds upon the phrase, the house of the Lord. Because that's what we're dealing with. And it just is an add-on to it. We've already stated that this, ver this chapter of Psalm 24 is very prophetic in itself. And we've already stated that it's referring to the millennial reign of Christ. And it's where he sits down and takes the throne of his father, David. Now, one thing I do love to do is the Bible interprets itself. When we look at the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, we can flip to the New Testament and see where so-and-so quoted this verse. Well, there's one verse that was quoted in the New Testament. Psalm chapter 24 and verse 1 states, The earth is the Lord's, the, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 26 state? For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. So we have this repeated in the New Testament as well. Now let's look at the poetic style of Psalm 24. Really, when we get down to the poetic style, we look at verses 1 through 3. I am not a Hebrew poetry uh, professional, I, nor do I claim to be. But I do try to bring it out to the best of my ability. In Psalm chapter 24, 1 through 3, where the Bible states, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill, Lord, or who shall stand in its holy place? Really, this is what they refer to as synonymous parallelism. And when we look at those three verses, what they do is they repeat themselves, but in different words. So those three verses fall under synonymous parallelism. Now, when we get into the history of the psalm, and we start digging and diving, we know that somebody wrote the psalm, and that was David. And what did he want to do extremely, extremely badly? But God said, no, you had too much bloodshed on your hands. You cannot do it. Go to a house for the Lord, which we know is the temple. And what is probably, I would consider it one of the main pieces of the temple. The main pieces of furniture. What do you think that would be? And I know I'm pulling for specifics, which I shouldn't do, but. Well, let me ask you this. What is the last part of Psalm 24 talking about? Prince, a queen, your average Joe, a king. And what's one thing that a king typically has if you think about a king? He has a throne. And what's the throne of God on the earth? Or it was during the time of the Jews? What's that model? Oh, okay. The Okay, you're thinking, you're right, but there's something specific about the tabernacle and the temple that is the throne of God. There's even been movies about this with people. The Ark of the Covenant is where God dwelt between the wings of the cherubim and the form of a cloud in the wilderness. And did David ever have to do anything with the Ark of the Covenant? Was it always in Jerusalem? No. No. Where was it at one point? It was at uh, Obed. I think it was the name. Very close. Obedidim. And how did it get to the house of Obedidim? They carried it there. Very good. Captain Obvious. They carried it there. Why did it have to go to the house of Obed-Edom anyhow? Why wasn't it in Jerusalem? I know I'm pulling my brains now. Because David was afraid to take it to 
it uh, killed one of the guys. You're a little bit forward in time. Let's go back to years ago. Well, that's why that's why it took it so that he was taking his feet, you know, into the into the down, to, into the temple. Very good, brother. You're you're getting there. You're getting there. We have a high priest who lost the voice of God. He wouldn't know the voice of God really because he was far from him. He had two sons that were extremely wicked. They committed heinous crimes in the temple. We're talking about a high priest Eli in the time of Samuel, Samuel and his sons Hophni and Phinehas. And I believe it was Phinehas that had a son that name, name was Ichabod. And the reason he was named Ichabod was because the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant, they placed it in the temple of Dagon, and God said that we're not going to have this, and he just ended up destroying the temple, the god Dagon basically, cutting off the head, the hands, to the point that he was just a stop. So that Poseidon is basically what it was, that's how we would know Dagon by Poseidon. That merman that was king was cut down to his fish stump. And, says he, and then plagues came upon the people in that town. So they moved it. And they moved it. And finally ended up in the house of Obadiah. And God blessed Obadiah. But David said, it's, you know what? It's time we need to bring the throne of God back to Jerusalem. And that's where it belongs. And when we look at this psalm, David, in verse 7, this is where they're really getting it from. It is believed that the history of the psalm is that David wrote it to either commemorate or to be sung while they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. If we get down to verse 7, Lift up ye he your heads, O ye gates, the gates of Jerusalem, and be ye lifted up ye everlasting doors, the doors of the temple, and the King of glory shall come in. That is why they believe that this song was actually written either commemorating or with the purpose of being sung when the ark was actually <laughs> brought back to Jerusalem. The other thing too is that this song has a strong connection with the New Year's festival of the Jews. I'll sing it then. Now, let's look at Christ in the psalm. According to Keith L. Brooks, Christ, the ascended Savior, is here seen as head and crown of the universe, the King of glory. He it was who could ascend the hill of the Lord, meeting, excuse me, meeting perfectly all the requirements. He has entered there as the forerunner of all, excuse me, who trust him and shortly is coming again to be acknowledged King of kings and the Lord of lords. If we would try to divide this chapter or this psalm, it will be divided into three sections. Verses 1 and 2, which state, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. It would then be divided into verses 3 through 6. Who shall ascend into the hill, Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he, sh <coughs> he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. And then finally, verses 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. When we look at verses 3 through 6, which is the second section, they claim that this is referred to as the pilgrim's entrance hymn. And verses 7 through 10 has been described as the hymn for the entrance of the ark or Yahweh into the temple. Having a double reference. 
one, either the Ark of the Covenant entering into the temple, or Jesus Christ, God himself, when he comes back to take the throne of his father David. When we look at this, ver this chapter to begin with, Psalm 24, it actually could be very well coupled with Psalm chapter 15. And we've already talked about Psalm 15 in the past, but we've read Psalm 24 today, so just so you know where we're coming with it, Psalm 15 states, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, that speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth not his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Psalm chapter 15 can be coupled with Psalm 24 in the sense that it helps answer the question, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Psalm chapter 15 elaborates on that quite nicely. Now let's look and talk about Psalm chapter 24 explained. So as we look at Psalm chapter 24, there's something that we should notice right off the bat in the very first phrase. The earth is the Lord's. Is there anything that pops out right there at us? It's all capitalized. It's not just um, El Shaddai or Elohim. If we go back to Genesis, it would be Elohim as creator. But here we find it's all caps. What do we know about the King James Version of the Bible when the word Lord is all caps?
And how did the devil get control of the earth? Because he was going down to the earth. Oh, the devil didn't get control of the earth because of that, brother. No, but he, but he put the devil down to the earth for his domain. He threw the devil down to the earth, but when the devil fell on the earth, it still belonged to man. At that point, it still belonged to man. And how did the devil conquer the man? So what did man do? Man sinned. He ate of the fruit and sinned. He, the devil could have said all the enticing words he wanted, but man knew better. The woman was deceiving. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And as soon as he took the bite of that fruit, he forfeited everything he owned, the earth, Control the animals, control the earth, and all went to the devil. Now, the devil still rules this earth, but does he still hold the title deed to the earth? There is a title deed to the earth. Just like you have a house with a title, just like you have a car with a title, there is a title to the earth. No, the devil does not have the title deed anymore. But where is the title deed to the earth? It is recorded in the Word of God in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. I say 4, it's probably 5. I think it's 5 on the left. It is 5. Someone please read Revelation 5 and verse 1. The seven-sealed book in the book of Revelation chapter 5 is the title deed to the earth. This is not the first time I've brought this out. We've done a study on the title deed of the earth in the past. I think it's the book of Ruth where uh, the men of the city of the gates were sitting there and there was a sealed book. There had to be two signatures on the back. But the person who was the near kinsman, redeemer, he could regain the title deed of the earth, the uh, title deed of the lost inheritance. Jesus Christ is the near kinsman to man that is the only one who is able to hold the title deed because everyone else has sinned. In Revelation chapter 5, the whole question there is, who is worthy to open the book? Who is the right person? Who is the right individual? Who is the one who is legally able to open this book and regain the inheritance? The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. The title deed to the earth is in heaven, and we see it revealed in Revelation chapter 5, and verse 1. Now, if we go back to, as we're going through this, we'll look at verse 2, where the Bible states, For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. When we go, just to jump back to verse 1, where the earth is the world, and they that dwell there, and the world is still talking about the earth itself, the literal physical earth. When we get into verse 2, it states that God hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the flood. How can God establish it upon the seas? Do we have any record of that? Does anything pop to mind that God could establish the earth and everything there upon the seas? It would be in Genesis. When he made the seas and everything else. But the thing is, and I'm just being picky, brother, that's all it is. But did God really make the seas? When we go back to Genesis chapter 1, probably about verse 2, what does it state? The earth was without form and void, darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The Spirit of God moved upon what? The face of the waters. The face of the waters. Now, can you read verses 6 through 10, please, Bob? God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. 
God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said that the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together the waters called these seas, and God saw that it was good. So God, in the very beginning, had the earth without form and void, but there was water on it. And then he starts creating. And when he starts creating, just like everybody else in here, if you start creating something, you have stuff in your way, you might have to start pushing other things out of the way. So he starts creating the firmament, and all of a sudden you see the waters going back. And then we have land up here. And as the land appears, what does that do? That pushes the water back farther. I'm not saying that God did not create the seas, because we know that there are lines where God says that this sea meets that sea. And we can see that physically on the earth. But God separated the waters, and he brought dry ground out of the water. And then we have something that man got deceitfully wicked, and every imagination was deceitfully wicked, and it was continually evil. And what did God do again? I shouldn't say again, but what did God do? He sent the flood. And what's the flood? That's right, it's H2O. And what did that H2O cover? Everything. It covered the ground. It covered the land. And all of a sudden, the earth was covered with water. But then he pushed back the water once again. So he brought it out of the water. He founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now, when we look at that word flood in the Hebrew, it doesn't mean flood like we think of it. We would think of a giant mass of water, and our mind would constantly, would immediately, or at least it should go to the Noah's flood. But when you look at it, it's actually rivers. And when at creation, did God establish anything at creation around rivers? If we go back to Genesis, probably chapter 2, I don't know if we mentioned it in chapter 1 or not. But God made something special. And he placed man in it. And what does the garden, what does the Bible tell us about the garden? There were four rivers that went around it. Oh, I'm not asking the name. But he established it upon the rivers. Now, for the sake of time, we're going to skip forward to uh, verses 7 through 10. Because we've already gone into detail in weeks past about who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord. He that hath clean hands and pure heart. We talked about the need for purity and righteousness. But in verses 7 through 10, the Bible says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. O ye gates, and even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord our host. He is the King of glory. Now when we look at this passage, 7 through 10, it's actually believed to be that it was a response to our reaction. This psalm was read, meant for either the commemorating a special occasion when the ark was brought back to Jerusalem, or David meant for it when it was brought back. And when we look at the Jews, it's not the first time that they did things with response to action. And we study out the law. And if we go back to everything, it's Exodus. You have Israel divided into two sections across on two different mountainsides. One would quote one law, and the other would cite back the other half. This is exactly what we have going on in, chapter, in verses 7 through 10. We have a group of choir, a choir group behind the closed doors, and a choir group with the Ark of the Covenant, or some other re religious piece that was supposed to represent the ark, or even some other religious piece of history when it comes to the Jews. And what they would do is they would come to the gates of Jerusalem, or some believe the gates of the temple. I believe it might have been both. But they would have came, and when they approached, the choir behind the doors would say, No, 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 no. 
who is the king of glory? And the group outside would say, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. And then maybe they would go in unison and lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. And then there will be another response from behind the doors. Who is this king of glory? And the open sesame, or the opening password to let them through and for the doors to be open will be the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. And then we have that musical pause or end to that section. See you love. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add to this passage at all? If not, we just know that this passage, along with, even though we studied it and gone through everything else, this passage is important because it forms a trilogy with Psalm chapter 2, 22, 23. And together they all should reveal to us the offices of Jesus Christ to give us better insight to who he was, who he is, and who he is to bow to come, or to become. Let us bow our heads in prayer as we prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory because it's all due you. Now, even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds be good soil for your word to follow, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts, that we would, that we would be transformed into your very image. Lord, anoint the song leader and the musicians as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord, as they lead us in the songs you have us to hear. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as it brings forth your message today, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we just would really receive it with gladness. Let everything be done in here, Lord, that God would be magnified and glorified in all things. And we ask this in the name of Jesus.